Beep, 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 beep. Welcome to the Court of the Evie Jester. I hope you're all well. Um, become a warrior teacher. Only a couple of days left now. Um, and, uh, excuse me. And, uh, you know, buy me a coffee if you can. All right, if you can help out that way, please do. Okay. Now, you'll remember the other day, with a bit of luck, if you've been listening, <clears throat> that, that, I, that I put something up where I was a bit confused about something said by Dr. Michael Fran about the repeal of the GRA and how it was tied up with the ECHR. Um, and it was a difficult thing to do, and we'd have to do X, Y, Z if it happened. And do you, you might recall that I put it up saying that I'm quite confused by what this is going on here, what's, what the discussion is about, and what it actually means. Um, so I was very pleased to find, written by Danny Nicholl, another response on the uh, um, on the GRA repeal blogspot.com site, which the links, of course, as usual, are in the doobies for you there, so you can look at those. But I was pleased to get this because um, it added some more clarity to this particular thinking that uh, is going on and me trying to understand what the reasons are, why there are any reasons we can't just simply repeal the lot and get it done. Um, there should be no such thing as false passports. and This kind of hiding in plain sight shouldn't be allowed to happen. Um, I know people are moan, well, some people you can't tell, but with some people you can't tell. If you can't tell, you can't tell. Yeah, we're going to have to live with that now because we made the mistake, didn't we? But, but, and here's the big but, um, the full force of the law should be on the other side. Single spaces, single sex spaces. Um, so, you know, and defining very carefully what sex is and therefore sexuality. So uh, let me just go through this and see what you think about what Danny Nickel had to say. Um, and perhaps you can let me know in the comments what your opinions are. But please do make sure you share this from YouTube. Like, share, like, subscribe. That's the big thing, liking things. Share, like and subscribe. The more likes it gets, the more it goes up the algorithm. Sounds rude. Doesn't it? Sounds, like a, sounds like a euphemism. What are you going to do tonight? I'm going to go up his algorithm. <laughs> OK, so... Dr. Michael Farran, Danny begins, has expressed the view that, to say the least, the fact the repeal of the Gender Recognition Act would put the UK in breach of international human rights law is enough to ensure that it would never succeed in Parliament. Repealing the GRA is a pipe dream, said Michael on the 28th of July this year, which is when I put up my video about it. Hmm. To which the response here is, it is good that Dr. Farran has spelled out his objection. Doing so facilitates debate and is valuable for, for those of us on the biological realist side of the gender conflict to de debate aims and strategy. I wouldn't call it the, I wouldn't call it the biological realist, I call it the right side. The side of good and reason. Okay, uh, of the gender conflict to debate aims and strategy. It would also be good if some of our prominent campaigning organisations, such as Sex Matters and the LGB Alliance, could emulate Dr. Fran's candour and tell us whether they'll campaign for the repeal of the GRA and of the protected characteristic of gender reassignment in the Equality Act. And if not, why not? It's true enough that in Goodwin versus United Kingdom 2002, the European Court of Human Rights held that since there are no significant factors of public interest to weigh against the interest of this individual applicant in obtaining legal recognition of her gender reassignment, the court reaches the conclusion that the fair balance that is inherent in the convention now tilts decisively in favour of the applicant. There has accordingly been a failure to respect her right to private life in breach of Article 8 of the convention, the right to respect and for private life, private and family life. This then continues, or rather the article continues. The GRA created the system of legal recognition of gender reassignment desired by the court. Can we get rid of it? I would argue, contra Ferran, that we can. I would argue that repeal cannot be dismissed as a pipe dream for a combination of legal and political reasons. I would add a few cultural ones in and might do along the way. The British Constitution is based on the sovereignty of Parliament, not on the supremacy of international human rights law, which is the first point that is being made. I believe that to be true. First things first, as a matter of purely domestic law, there is no necessity for the UK Parliament to comply with the judgments of the European Court of Human Rights. Purely from a domestic law, Point of view. Hmm, interesting. The British Constitution is based on the sovereignty of the UK Parliament. I should hope so too. That means that Parliament has the right to make or unmake any law. So just so 
just as it made the GRA, it could also unmake the GRA. In other words, repeal it. Furthermore, under the British Constitution, international law does not enter the domestic legal system automatically. It needs to be introduced into our national law. This so often happens by Parliament passing a statute. Thus, Parliament passed the Human Rights Act 1998 so that UK courts could, to some extent, give effect to ECHR. That's the European Court of Human Rights. Don't confuse that with the Equalities and Human Rights Commission, as I constantly do. So, uh, just, to, just to repeat that, so we, thus Parliament passed the Human Rights Act in 1998 so that UK courts could, to some extent, give effect to ECHR rights, although did so after decades of our being in the European Convention on Human Rights at any rate. The Human Rights Act does not authorise the UK courts to disregard Acts of Parliament. Indeed, the Acts of Parliament, even if they are deemed incompatible within the rights of, with the rights in the Convention. So they, you can't just ignore it. If Parliament therefore were to pass an act repealing the GRA, our courts would have to enforce that repealing statute as a matter of, de of domestic law. Number two, the GRA seriously violates fundamental human rights, as does the Goodwin Judgment, which inspired its enactment. You understand? 2002, the Goodwin Judgment. That judgment made us as a country pass the Gender Recognition Act, which I think had more to do with avoiding gay marriage than anything else, but that's just me. <clears throat> the GRA creates a system of sex falsification. That's exactly what it does. And from a cultural perspective, that's a disaster. Men can obtain gender recognition certificates to say they are women. Women can obtain certificates to say they are men. If a certificate is granted and if the acquired gender is the female gender, then the person's legal sex for almost all purposes becomes that of a woman. The immense safeguarding dangers of this sex falsification for women and girls are well documented. The GRA therefore exposes girls and women to the very kind of human rights breaches which the ECHR is supposed to guard against. For example, under Article 3 ECHR, no one shall be subjected to torture or to inhumane and degrading treatment. That's an absolute right, by the way. Yet this is precisely the treatment to which a woman or girl may be subjected if a man enters a woman-only single-sex space, having felt entitled and emboldened to do so as a legal woman. The Goodwin GRA saga reminds us that the truth about rights is not self-evident. Merely because certain people are international judges does not make them any more competent than the rest of us to divine the authentic meaning of rights that the Goodwin judgment and the GRA clearly destroys the fundamental human rights of women and girls, serves to confirm this. It calls into question the utility of remaining in the ECHR. Nonetheless, for the time being, we're an, we're an ECHR contracting state, so let us now consider the nature of the court and the British Parliament's relationship with that court. The Ferran Pipe Dream argument disregards the nature of the European Court of Human Rights. When the European Court of Human Rights interprets the ECHR, it often says that the Convention is a living instrument. Although the words of the Convention do not change, the Court believes that it can update the meaning of these words in, li in line with changing social conditions through its interpretive efforts. Another consequence is that the, count the Court does not feel bound by its own previous decisions. It can effectively overrule them. It is highly controversial whether this living instrument claim is legitimate. It means that the court is making itself more powerful. It is doing so by going beyond the intentions of the sovereign nation states which negotiated and signed the ECHR. Nonetheless, the court frequently makes play of the idea that the ECHR is a living instrument, including in Godwin versus UK, the original case that brought about the Gender Recognition Act in Britain. What Dr. Farran ignores is that the living instrument idea cuts both ways. The court could use its dynamic mode of interpretation to discard the holding in Goodwin that the UK must have a system of recognition of transgender status. It could do so on the basis that it is now increasingly clear that adequate protection of the rights of women and girls requires it to change its laws. I would also add in there, of course, the fact that it makes being uh, sexuality a nonsense. That's what it's led to. Look again at the seminal paragraph 93 of the judgment cited above. This is the one where the 
judge said there's been an article, an interference in Article 8 of the person's private life, Goodwin. The court said there was no significant factors of public interest to weigh against the interest of the individual applicant. So the applicant was said to have had their um, Article 8 rights breached. The court said at the beginning of saying that no significant factors of public interest to weigh against the interest of this individual applicant. Essentially, the UK government failed to present any weighty arguments as to why there should not be a system for obtaining legal recognition of one's gender reassignment. How different things would be today if the case was heard now. There would be powerful arguments and plentiful evidence to show that a system of sex falsification invariably leads to human rights violations against women and girls. If the court is genuinely to treat the ECHR as a living instrument, it would also need to take into account the growing resistance to gender ideology in the ECHR states, including in those countries which have legislated to define gender on the basis of sex at birth. In this regard, it is naive to suppose that the court pays no heed to the need to keep contracting states within the ECHR system at a time when leaving it is becoming increasingly attractive. Point four in the article is the Ferran pipe dream argument disregards the character of the UK Parliament. Dr Ferran's arguments also rest on the notion that the UK Parliament slavishly carries out the instructions of the European Court of Human Rights. In fact, the UK Parliament is steeped in the ethos of parliamentary sovereignty. To be sure, it is true that under Article 46 ECHR, the contracting parties promise to comply with the final judgments of the court albeit only in cases to which they are parties, but this ignores the character of the UK Parliament. They are not always supine cap doffers. Wonderful. Indeed, British MPs started asserting themselves against the primacy of the European Court of Human Rights long before Brexit. In 2011, the UK Parliament got into a conflict with the Court of Human Rights over the issue of voting rights of prisoners. After an adverse judgment from the court about the state of British law, the House of Commons overwhelmingly carried a backbench motion that legislative decisions should be taken by democratically elected lawmakers and that it supported the current situation in which no prisoner is able to vote except those imprisoned for contempt, default or on remand. The vote was passed by 234 votes to 22. It is striking that only 22 MPs were seemingly prepared to register their support for the principle of automatic compliance with the European Court of Human Rights. The speeches show that most MPs thought that the court was acting beyond its powers. Dr Fran's pipe dream thesis would only be convincing if MPs displayed a forelock tugging deference to the decisions of the European Court of Human Rights. The evidence of the prisoner vote episode is exactly the opposite. But that was back in 2011. Now we are no longer in the heyday of legal globalisation. Britain has left the European Union. Disagreement between many MPs and the court over aspects of immigration policy has become fierce. Perhaps most importantly, the legitimacy of the entire ECHR system has been undermined by the authoritarian regimes in both Russia and Turkey. The purpose of the ECHR was precisely to stop authoritarian regimes from taking hold. The growing backlash against globalisation makes it likely that the court now holds less sway over MPs than it did when they refused to kowtow over prisoner voting. Finally, let us consider what's the worst that can happen if the UK Parliament were indeed to repeal the GRA. No doubt a transgender litigant would try to bring an action before the European Court of Human Rights to argue that repeal breaches his rights. To bring a case before the Court of Human Rights, such a neat litigant needs to exhaust his domestic remedies. The Convention requires this. That means he must bring his case, perhaps by way of judicial review, before the High Court, then the Court of Appeal, and then the United Kingdom Supreme Court. Only if the litigant believes that the Supreme Court has failed to accord him his ECHR rights may he make a complaint against the UK before the European Court of Human Rights. We are therefore talking about years of litigation during which time gender ideology may well become entirely discredited. Certainly the evidence of the malign effect of systems of sex falsification will, alas, pile up even more. We cannot be sure so far into the future how the court will respond to such evidence, nor how Parliament will respond to the court. In conclusion then, 
Parliamentary sovereignty means that there is no domestic legal imperative for British MPs to tug forelock of the judgment in Goodwin. Still less at subsequent cases on gender recognition to which the UK is not, was not a party, MPs indeed should support neither the Goodwin judgment nor the retention of the GRA, since both destroy the fundamental human rights of women and girls. There can be no certainty that the European Court of Human Rights, confronted in future with a conflict with the House of Commons, would stick to its guns on gender recognition in the face of a compelling evidence of the appalling effect on women and girls. Conversely, we would certainly cannot rule out that British MPs would face down the European Court of Human Rights if the political will is strong enough. I think it's an excellent piece. It's a, it's a rebuttal to Dr. Farhan, and it's a, a continuation of the conversation that we so desperately need to have. Um, I, I'm fairly stuck on this. I'm, I'm, I've reached the end of the road, I suppose. You know, this question's being asked now, but where do people stand? Sex matters, LGBT, where do people stand? Where does the Gay Men's Network stand? You know, so I think there's going to be these questions going to be asked of organisations, and I think it's fair that they should give us some idea about where, where exactly they think this is going. Um, from, my, from my perspective, we, we have to repeal the GRA. Um, we have to remove it from the Equalities Act. If necessary, we have to leave the um, ECHR. And we also need to, the ES, you know, ESG goals have got to go. We've got to get this stuff out of education, out of universities. Certainly, we have to get out of the NH NHS and urgently. Um, and we also need to make sure that we pass laws that mean this never, ever happens again, ever. That's what we need to do. And we've got to make equality of opportunity, which is what this is really about, you know. Equity versus equality of opportunity, equity, equality of outcome. Because of quality. That's where, that's at that's the root of most of this. Um, must be firmly embedded in our society, not just in the public sector equality duty, but I believe in the Companies Act would need an amendment. We're going to need amendments to laws that, that fund universities to make sure that that principle is reinstated and that universities can't go off of the deep end doing crap like they're doing. So in terms of the one simple thing, get rid of the GRA, that's it. It's got to go. And I also think, I, I don't think this, I, I, I wonder about this. If there's anybody watching who's Scottish, right, and who's a, a sort of absolute get rid of the Brits, you know, a William Wallace, right, then please do, in the comments or on Twitter, answer this question for me. Actually, for Wings might be a good person to ask about this. Wings of Scotland. Would you be comfortable if we removed devolved education from Scotland and removed devolved education from Wales in order to eradicate gender ideology, queer theory and critical race theory and critical, so all the other stuff that comes with it? That's a question I'd like to ask a few people and see whether or not we get some answers. Um, it's, time, it's time we made some declarative statements, folks, because... Repeating the GRA should absolutely be the next thing and making sure that nothing like this ever happens again and that official documents, anything official whatsoever, is registered with your birth sex because that's the only damn thing that matters. Who are we? It's the starting place. Who are we? Male, female? Man, woman? Girl, boy. That's it. Okay? That reality anchor which makes sure that the ship of humanity keeps floating. Let's keep having the conversation. Um, thank you very much for that article. It was great. And uh, yeah, go on, go do your thing. I'll, I'll catch up with you soon. Bye-bye.